I'm going to welcome everyone to our second in a series of lectures, Proud by Design. Um, I'm Gloria Kondrup, and I am the executive director of the Hoffman's Milken Center for Typography. And part of what we do, of course, besides exhibitions, publications, workshops, is we have this wonderful lecture series. And I'm going to turn it over to Clifford Pun. Clifford Pun is the senior coordinator here at the HCT. He's been our senior coordinator for since 2018. So he's been very instrumental in um, putting together a lot of our webinars. I think we've done 90 now, would you say? 90 lectures since? Roughly, uh, yeah. Roughly 90 minutes. <laughs> so um, <laughs> you're in a long line of wonderful um, people who have uh, joined us over the last few years to do lectures. And uh, Clifford, besides being a coordinator, is a artist and a photographer in his own right. Uh, he got his MFA from, I believe, Cal Arts. Cal so Arts. Clifford, he's going to be your host and moderator today. So I'm turning it over and I will come back at the end because I have questions, but I'm going to let you guys take over now. Hmm. I'll see you in a bit. Yeah, on the other side. Thank you, Gloria. Um, we have two very uh, special guests today uh, on our panel, uh, Ramon Tejada and Silas Munro. And um, Ramon Tejada is a Dominican York designer and educator based in Providence, Rhode Island, and occasionally in Southern California. He works in a hybrid design teaching practice, focusing on collaboration, inclusion, unearthing, and a responsible expansion of design, a practice he has named puncturing, quote unquote. Ramon is an associate professor in the graphic design department at RISD. Silas Munro is an artist, designer, writer, and curator. He founded the LGBTQ plus and minority owned graphic design studio, Polymode, based in Los Angeles and Raleigh, North Carolina, I think, right? Yeah which works mm -hmm. with clients across cultural spheres. He was a contributor to W.E.B. B. Dubois' Data Portraits, Visualizing Black America, and co-authored the forthcoming first BIPOC-centered design history course, Black Design in America, African Americans and the African Diaspora, and Graphic Design, 19th to 21st Century. Munro is faculty co-chair for the MFA program in Graphic Design, at the Vermont College of Fine Arts. I hope I got that all right. <laughs> Anyways, the uh, first uh, speaker will be Ramon. So Ramon, please take it away. All right, thank you, Clifford yeah. and Gloria, for uh, inviting Silas and I to chat. And thank you everybody for being here. Thanks for that intro, Clifford. Um, I'm glad that I didn't have to do that. <laughs> Although I'm gonna talk about some of the things um, that you mentioned there, puncturing, et cetera. So I, I'm Ramon and I make design. I am making design again, which I'm super excited about. And then I teach and I teach at RISD and both of these practices are um, integral to sort of the overall idea of what I tend to do as a designer or what I do as a designer. And before we get going, I wanted to um, just do a little Latin acknowledgement. Um, I actually, most of the time I am in Providence, but I am in Southern California right now. I'm in the Coachella Valley, which is the lands of the Coelia people. And I just want us to take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of this American continent whose lands we live on. Um, I know we have a lot of people, we have some people here that are abroad, um, but I'm, it, it, it make a clear distinction to think about the entire American continent, not just of North America, the United States. And think about how we actively reflect on all the peoples and generations that have made it possible for us to be here collectively. Think thoughtfully, intentionally, and honestly how we honor and acknowledge all of these ancestors in our work as designers and more importantly as communities. Um, so to start off, I'm going to read this. So let me get it off my chest right away. We must decolonize, queer eyes, colorize. There's a bunch of other terms that we can use now, open up design to allow the margins to emerge and explode in all its complexity and beauty without a compromise right now. Um, and I wrote that for this piece called Popple, the Tropes, Grip of the Canon for the Walker Art Center Sandboard in 2018 at an invitation by my friend Nicole Killian, who goes with designer that a lot of you may probably know. 
um, Nicole was editing a series, a piece called How Will We Queer Design Education Without Compromise? And that was actually the beginning of it, um, of the piece that I wrote. And it was kind of the beginning of starting to think about this idea of puncturing, what I've sort of started to think about as puncturing. So puncturing, which Clifford mentioned, and, and it's sort of the, the concept that I've been thinking about my design practice, all the parts of it living under, puncturing creates gaps possibilities and fosters pluralistic imagination. It asks us to actively define and or redefine our accepted standards and foundations. Two words that I think in design and in graphic design we have to deal with um, because they're sort of embedded in the structure of like how we see, do things, have done things. Um, but puncturing has also become a methodology, if you will, or a process for my work as a designer and as a teacher. Um, that GIF in the background there, thank you, GIF, for all these GIFs. I did not make any of these. Um, that GIF in the background was one of the things I found when I started to research and started to think about some of this. And to me, that's what design should really look like. It's just messy. This idea that design needs to be this like organized, cleaned up thing that we go in and clean up. To me, that's like um, just, just there's something off about that. Um, and another idea that I think it's important to sort of think about within the context of this work is the idea of decolonization, right? It is a term and idea that can mean many things to many people, right? It's not a singular idea. But for me, decolonizing is about physical visibility, structural change, representation, acknowledgement, giving up space, responsible expansion, thinking of a diversity of lineages, thinking about our communities. And I'm not necessarily interested in a design community always, thinking about mom, dad, grandparents, your neighbor, our children, families, and acknowledging not knowing and making the periphery in the center. So I think one of the key ideas for me under this umbrella of puncturing has been um, redefining or defining what I mean by certain things and making sure that I'm not just trafficking in the generic definitions, which I think sometimes um, graphic design has trafficked in a lot. So when we're making work, we're not we're ignoring communities per se. We're not being specific, um, and and thinking about the communities, BIPOC communities, LGBTQ plus communities, you know, like you want to make sure that those communities are part of it, not just sort of wrapped up under some sort of generic blanket. Um, so I think that idea of redefining or defining for yourself um, this terminology, I think, is a is a critical part of this. So a lot of this has been this process, and I give some props to Silas here, which Silas and I collaborate often and have a lot of chatting. Silas, we were teaching, we were gonna be doing this class in the MFA program at Otis in LA three, four summers ago. And Silas dropped this, I was in Mexico City, Silas was in LA and Silas was like, it's called digging. And I just was like, that's it, that's the word. So a lot of it is about digging and unearthing and looking and thinking and making, and reflecting and expanding everything about design, everything about graphic design and design writ large, right? So digging for newer things, unearthing lineages, unearthing stories, unearthing people, unearthing work, looking and relooking, thinking about things, making and remaking, reflecting, expanding, and it's this everlasting loop that just keeps going. And a lot of this, um, I've, I've, I've sort of codified a little bit with the help of some of the writings of Gloria Saldua at her incredible book, Borderlands. Uh, James Baldwin talks a lot about this. <laughs> Sister Corita Ken talks some of this. And the Dominican performance artist, Josefina Baez, also speaks about this idea of people that are part of certain groups having to do a digging and unearthing things that have not been part of the sort of the, the standard. Um, things have been relegated to the margin. Um, so this this lineage, this digging, all started to take shape in, in, into this whole sort of like, what do I need to read? What do I need to look at? Some of it is not design. Some of it is, is is coming from other places, coming from history, coming from literature, coming from music, coming from uh, thinkers. Again, Baldwin thinking of Octavia Butler, thinking of Toni Morrison, who asked a lot of really incredible questions about this in literature, and I think in many ways, some of these thinkers have given us uh, windows, or if you will, under which we can throw ourselves into and sort of see how we can sort of develop new processes for design. Um, processes that are uh, 
uh, a bit more respectful um, and that actually are more inclusive rather than exclusive. Um, and, and, and I think that that's really important. This all kind of coalesced into the Decolonizing Design Reader, which was a poster first for a lecture that I did at Pratt uh, in New York years ago in the art history department, not the design department, although I used to teach in the design department. Um, I made a printed edition for the uh, MFA book fair at Otis a few years ago, flashing all my typographic wares because I love my type. Um, but ultimately the thing lives the best in this part here, which is a screenshot from the uh, Google document that is still going and ongoing. And I try to update it. People send me stuff. I try to update it every month. <laughs> I think I've fallen behind about a month or so. But it's really thinking about how you go through a document and you dig through and find things that are important for you and your practice, like things that help you rather than generic things that become sort of codified as like the thing. Um, lots of question asking. A lot of it also in my practice, the way that I'm thinking about it, and particularly now that I'm back to really thinking about making out a few years where I just really, it was hard to make things because some of these ideas were in, in, in contrast to sort of design education and what design I learned and how to make things. And I think part of when that happens, you have to take some time, you have to take a step back and start to re-examine and rethink and maybe remake. Um, what, what is it that I do as a designer? What is it that I make? Do I even make things? Do we even need to make things as designers, right? Um, and, and that's a tricky question because a lot of us love to make things. <laughs> just the idea that we would make things is is uh tricky so thinking about collaborations which i think is really incredible part of this idea of seeing or re-seeing design differently collaboration is mostly about sharing and learning and making with a lot of joy i think that that's critically important you have to make with a lot of joy um you also have to let, let go of your ego. You have to share, you have to work in collaboration and realize that perhaps you yourself, this hero, amazing designer, you're not it. <laughs> you, you know, you're just not it. You need a bunch of people and some of them might not be designers in the traditional sense, right? So you have to acknowledge that. So you start to make with, I started to make with students. So this was a Google sheet before Miro, by the way just so everybody knows, because this is easier to do now with Moreau, but this was a Google Sheet with a grad class that I taught at MCAT in Minneapolis. Um, and it was a collective design history, thinking about uh, what histories does somebody as a designer need to know to make the work they want to make, rather than the work that shows up in every book of design that maybe we think we want to make, but maybe that's not what we want to make. This is actually like a 12 foot long scroll I just reduced the whole thing to shrink it down just so you can see. And um, every different color is a different person. So it's annotated in such a way so that they collaborated and they kept adding. And the one thing that you don't see here is that this whole this whole entire thing came with a series of conversations in class, rather than just, this is just the artifact that was made, which lives online, um, a printed edition of it. But actually, the conversation was the richer thing. This is just sort of like a a, a, a sort of an imprint, a, a starter for that conversation, if you will. Um, teaching again. So this is Silas and I in the throwing the Bauhaus under the bus, the first edition, which Josue, who's here, was in and whose work is right over here on the left hand side. And you see him peeking out over there in that GIF. Um, and this is like one of my favorite, this video is one of my favorite pieces of stuff from a teaching class that I've ever done, <laughs> partly because we're all in the shot, looking at this thing that just way was like playing through, trying to make. Um, and part of this was uh, like our, uh, Salas and I were really interested in sort of this investigation mm -hmm. of form making and all of these, in many ways, tropes of like how you make form and how you give for meaning um, and it was just an exciting two weeks working with a group of grad students and the collaboration between the two of us I think has become critical for both of us being that we've done it multiple times and we keep going so it's, it's this great thing that it's like the it takes time and it develops and there's new questions that keep coming up including last night when we were talking in person 
<laughs> last night at like 10 p.m. we were talking in person. Um, and then, yes, I do love part of the Bauhaus. house. So that's me at the Bauhaus house two summers ago. So I, I, I put that picture because people kept thinking that I really did not, but I do. Um, collaborated with, with a bunch of friends. Again, this is part of BIPOC design history. Silas is um, and Brian, his partner's project. And this is, I led the incomplete Latinx stories of the Senor Grafico uh, and put together, curated a series of conversations and talks about Latinx design, um, including this incredible talk by Ana Parisi and Juan Pablo Rajal on queerness and race in Brazilian art and design, which um, I rip Silas was also part of. Um, and just th the incredible amount of work that exists there from the queer community in Brazil for a long time to talk about race and queerness and gayness and community, we kind of were flabbergasted. I think in Stella's presentation, you'll see some of the work that was shown there because there was this incredible sort of like localized design that was happening. And in many ways, um, it's one of the things that I think is the thesis of this particular series of talks is that in Latin American, there is a difference between capital D design and like local and, and, and sort of lowercase design, which is very local and rooted in the communities that live there rather than sort of graphic design, which is sort of like corporate and for selling things and sort of a capitalistic endeavor of it. Um, and more recently, this is, I'm wrapping up with some recent work that I've done, some collaborations, which I think are really important. Um, this is, I did a, a project. This is Kenneth, the poet, Kenneth Reves' Mopes, which is a book of poems in three acts. And um, we actually, Kenny and I kind of worked on this together through Zoom. I had never actually um, opened up my InDesign file to actually work live with a writer. Um, so it's, it's a huge privilege to be able to work with a writer and working on poetry is pretty exciting and pretty daring because sometimes the things that I'm like, well, but I can't do that because in graphic, it's like, well, I don't really care what graphic design has to say about that. That's the rhythm of my line. And you're not messing with it because the kerning has to, no, I want it that way. And I, and then we would go into conversations and it was this incredibly like fruitful conversation that led to this uh, sort of Kenny's child, Mopes. Um, I was originally supposed to just design the cover, by the way, but I ended up designing the whole thing. And it became really exciting to be able to do that. I actually, to some people scary, I actually do use uh, Zoom to do final edits on work <laughs> with clients because sometimes it's just faster and I can get them through much faster than, than PDFs. Um, and in the last year and a half, I've been working um, with ISLA in New York, which is the Institute for Studies of Latin American Art. Um, and they're in New York City. Um, and uh, they approached me and it sort of like to work on, they do these exhibitions and these gallery guides. I've been working on the gallery guides with them. Um, and this is just an installation view of the exhibit, which is Arrows Rising Visions of the Erotic in Latin American Art. And I worked with the, the curators that worked on this show and to do the gallery guide. So this is the gallery guide and the pink line, the pink irradiant came on. Um, but I was really interested in sort of like the conversation that I always had. I'm always super interested in like, there's all these narratives that uh, these curators were exploring uh, in Latin American artists. I had not encountered actually of all the Latin American projects that are done with this. I haven't encountered like 95% of those artists ever anywhere in all the education. So talk about digging. And I'm like, where are these people? Where are they coming from? What have they been doing? And they've been doing this incredible work. Some of it, which is incredibly conceptual. Some of it, which is incredibly aggressive. Some of it, which is highly political. Um, um, and then I started to think about how do I make containers that hold all those ideas? How do I make containers that elevate that narrative rather than just sort of plug and play? Um, into sort of structures. And one of the rules that I have for this series is all the typography that I use has to be designed by Latinx type designers. And that's like, I will not budge on that rule for this project because I think it's important to have people that are part of that, of that community sort of start to like have forms that help us to tell those stories rather than just sort of like another type designed by another 
guy from pick your country graphic designers that you know like the the greatest hits of graphic of type design um so that's this is one one edition of it there's been multiples and this is the show that's actually up right now, which is Nyan de Roga, the Feliciano Centurio and Archival Collection. And again, I'm showing you a, 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 an installation view partly because there's a lot of collaboration between me and the curators in terms of what their vision is going to be as to how the show is going to be designed. And then how I sort of, um, how the, gal the gallery guy can sort of like add to that or be part of that. Um, and I never encountered the work of Feliciano Centurio uh and i kind of i'm sort of what some of uh, somewhat obsessed there isn't a lot of his work a lot of the work exists in images of it except for the the familia which is the family of those three animals to the left there these lovely things with the knitted sweaters I, every time i see them i kind of want to try to jump and take one of them but i cannot um and you start to see here sort of like this again this there's feliciano um this try to get this container that is speaking to that, speaking to the way the that he was thinking of making work, particularly the, a lot of his work that is that we have that exists is the work that he was making towards the end of his life as he was dying of AIDS, um, and he got very ill and started making things in bed. So there's a lot of knitting and thinking about the tradition of knitting, which his grandmother taught him in a particular tradition, and usually that is just was made by women but he got to do it. So there's something about that that I was very interested in thinking about sort of knitting, but it's also, I, I feel like in the air for a lot of graphic designers who are very into knitting and and ceramics are very popular right now. So uh, it was interesting conversations with the curators because they never sort of were like, oh, graphic designers are into knitting? Like, what is this? Um, so again, thinking of the collaboration, I'm thinking of making containers that bring out these stories and these narratives of these um, BIPOC, Latinx, queer artists. Uh, Centurion was gay. Uh, the artists in Eros Rising, most of them are uh, LGBTQI+. Uh, some of them are dead, some of them are alive. It was really interesting series of conversations. I'm thinking about my role as a designer as being part of the group of people that bring these voices out and elevates them. Um, out of those margins that they've been in. So as I finish, one of the things that I, I always start to, to ask um, students, people, designers for all of us, myself, is start to think about some questions as to like sort of how we're functioning, thinking about who am I and, uh, and who am I or you making with rather than making for and thinking about how we shift that relationship. Because I think particularly when we're talking about communities, you have to have a different relationship, right? Like this idea of I'm working for somebody versus I'm, I'm working with in collaboration with. Shifting that is, I find very uh, fruitful. Thinking about whose voices or stories are we elevating, right? Like in, in our projects and how are we doing that, right? Like what, what structures are we designing within these things that we're making, whether that is a poster or a website, uh, uh, a sort of a building, whatever it is the form, that the form takes. And starting to think about how with mom and dad, grandma, grandpa, your chosen families, your community, thinking how we explore and activate lowercase design and lowercase art to build value and center communities, right? And that's a shift in sort of, I think for us as designers to think about, to think about community rather than to think about clients and that kind of language that we've been, you know, like that's been so pervasive in design um, history and practices. Um, and then I'm just going to end. So when you get the link, there's all these resources in the back, the last slide. There's actually links throughout all the presentations because everything is linked. So there's some stuff here for you to dig through um, and, and just a little tiny quick curation of stuff that I think is applicable to this audience. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Ramon, yeah. for that. It's very very interesting. Hopefully that um, was I, under time. But. You, you've <laughs> just made it on time, I think. We're, 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 we're good on time. Um, our next speaker is Silas. So Silas, please take it away. Yeah, thank you so much, Ramon. That um, was really moving. It's really powerful. Um, it was really nice to just like be connected again and like be connected in the space. And there's there's so many call and responses between the two of us, which I think is um, 
part of why we resonate with each other. Um, so I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about like my own practice, but kind of like Ramon, I think a lot of my practice comes out of being in community and, and working in collaboration. And my main collaboration is running a design studio called Polymode. And the poly Polymode was actually the name of my graduate thesis at CalArts, um, which was about like many ways of working, many modes of being. And in my thesis, I was like really grappling with like, who am I and how does that relate to being a graphic designer? And with good fortune, I've been able to like take that theoretical idea and turn it into a practical idea. And I think that's the power of education, design education in schools that you can be in spaces where you can really explore and bring that out into the world. And I feel like there's a, a very much a feedback loop between both of those things. And so we make everything from websites, publications to a typeface. And um, rather than talk about it, we actually just made a reel that's kind of new, a, a bunch of recent work, which is about two minutes. So um, you'll get to see um, polymodalness and, and also a lot of queerness too. There's no sound, so uh, I may just jump in, but I think as you just saw there, like part of our interest in polymode is also like, yes, we wanna make theoretical interesting things, but sometimes you just wanna make cool shit. <laughs> and I think having the permission to make things that are interesting to you that are playful or irreverent or um, unexpected, uh, we get a lot of joy out of that. One of the things that you'll see a lot in this presentation in this reel is the typeface Polymod Sands, which is a typeface that we did in collaboration with XYZ which is a type design studio in poly mode. And in addition to it's like bold and italic, it has this access of realness or queerness. So you can see that the queerness is kind of a spectrum, an exploration. I think part of why I feel like this reel also like embodies our practice is like what I've come to know about design is like it's in flux all the time, like both in terms of the outputs of the things that we make, but also the way that we work. I think being a queer person, queer designer, like is actually an asset. Could it allows me to bring a kind of outside perspective, um, a, a kind of point of view that's not necessarily expected, even if the material isn't about gay people or queer folks. Ramon talked about this already, this BIPOC design history course um, courses now. Um, in addition to the Latinx, there's been a SWANA course that um, Randa Hadi uh, put out. And then of course, the first course on uh, Black Design America that started all. And I think one of the things that was like fundamental about that project was also um, being anti-capitalist and like, how do you actually pool your resources and how do you actually share and allow the benefit for all? And part of that comes from this idea of like the model of the studio as a family. This is an idea that we learned from Mark Bradford, an artist who's a, a black queer visual artist who's very influential and someone who really um, was always very generous with us when we collaborated with him. And that generosity has passed on. So the work that you saw in that reel, uh, it's not just my work, but the work of Randon, Michelle, Audrey, and then the animators, actually Edgar, who's not in this picture, um, who, who uh, collaborated on that work. And also, in addition to the idea of like having these other team members, that relationship with Brian Johnson, who's my business partner, is fundamental into how the studio runs. This is me in grad school, Brian and I going to the opera. And I guess I'd want to like, say all of this like abundance of creativity, like it comes out of like friendship. So I, I guess for students, I would just encourage you like to, to stay close to your classmates and like you never know what might happen uh, to each other. This is in 2008. And then this is like a couple of weeks ago, Brian and I went to the Met Opera with a client and just the idea of like, opera is not something I was ever really interested in or what I think about, but Brian was and like I've fallen in love with it. And so I think 
also collaborations can allow you to get out of yourself and experience something else. So this is a little bit of like um, pictures. We call these the bad girl photos sometimes where we're like kind of being able to like relax or like be campy or just kind of do whatever we want. And so I think that all also that studio family means also a relationship unfolding over time. Ramon put a uh, sister Greta Kent's uh, tenants of a education um, in his slide. And one of the things she talks about is trying to find a place that you trust and trust it for a while, which I think uh, speaks to Ramon and our collaboration, you know, whether it was the Bauhaus under the bus that he talked a lot about, or Ramon has been a guest at Vermont College of Fine Arts, where I um, helped co-found an MFA program in graphic design that's low residency. And I'm always interested in bringing new perspectives, whether that's in physical space or in virtual space. Um, this is like the untucked behind the scenes from the Latinx <laughs> uh, class or like putting on funny things at our face. Um, and I think in the in the the face, you know, Ramon was talking about a lot of quite heavy topics and, and a lot of my work addresses that too, but like, how do you find uh, resistance and, and joy is a form of resistance and rest and kikiing and you know, sending little hearts on Instagram, I think is really helpful. Um, I feel like Ramon talked about this a lot, but I just, I just wanted to put it in here, like not just in the real, it's just how, how much this changed me to facilitate a series of courses. The first one, which had, well, several of them had my own design history teachers in there, in the class to, to learn from me, but also other collaborators. And in the process, I've learned so much from other folks and, and just how that space of education doesn't have to be a one way that it can be actually like this um, uh, flattened hierarchy, which I think has a sort of queer aspect to it. And I feel like none of this would be possible without uh, a modality that we use at Polymode called poetic research. You might ask like, what does that mean? Um, and poetic research is this um, kind of lateral thing. I, I actually love that, Ramon, I forgot I said the digging thing. I always thought you said the, the, the digging thing, but it, poetic research is the digging, right? It's puncturing, it's lineages, it's unearthing things, it's amplifying stories that are not seen. It is structure and structuring information. Also has to do with the practical too as well. And how does that all connect? And I think part of also poetic research gives us and like anyone who participates in it to be them full self. So now I'm a queer and uh, black, um, my mom's from Africa, from Uganda. I'm also a surfer too. So like poetic research allows multiple modalities to be happening at the same time, which I think is very polymodal. And I think especially considering that this is Pride Month, but we're also encountering really gnarly legislation in our own country. And I'm thinking about in Uganda, which recently renewed the death penalty and jailing people for being gay. Made me sort of think like, why, why and like, what's the importance of the work that I do? Um, and what is this importance of, of questioning it? And poetic research is also like making with a question. So what does it mean to be known yet different, to be understood, to be felt, to be remembered, which is a few questions from the last project that I'll show you, which is about a, a BIPOC queer design history archive that um, Brian and I facilitated at the Walker Art Center. And this idea of like coming back and going back and get it, uh, Safi, uh, Saki Mafunduko, who's a Zimbabwean designer, uh, invokes the idea of Sankofa, which is uh, an African term and symbol from the Indinkra nation in what is now Ghana, about going into the past and finding a new way of telling a story or finding things that are unearthing. And one of the projects that I'm really proud about that is about a queer lineage is taking and pushing back, kind of like the Bauhaus at Alfred Barr's Cubism and abstract art diagram, which is very colonial, very problematic in the way that it looked at modernism and art and people from the global South and North. And um, through a process of a commission from Ellen Lupton and our own research, Brian and I, and a former student of mine, Ben Warner, like dug through queer archives. And I think part of that digging is also exploration, like finding icons like Marsha P. Johnson that we know about, but like unknown 
um, sort of matchbooks in communication, key activists like Gay Liberation Front, uh, traumatic things like tattoos and that's the concentration camps and um, AIDS crisis and how there's like common symbols that come together and that allows us to make this sort of queer reframing of art and design history to see ourselves and remix what history is through graphic production and that idea of like mapping and also intersectionalities like blackness and queerness in the Harlem Renaissance for instance and how that also got to be in dialogue with publishing so in addition to being a graphic designer and educator I'm really interested in like graphic design as a form of knowledge production so this showing up in uh, a book edited by Ellen Lupton, um, looking at feminism, inclusiveness, subversiveness, non-binariness was really powerful to me. And this idea of mapping and connecting lineages is also prevalent in a project that I got to do last year with the One Archives, which is where a lot of the research that we did, which is one of the largest collections of LGBTQIAS, 2S plus materials. And so a group of activists were asked to curate a series of posters um, and have interviews and discuss them. Um, this website is free to look up online. It's a really amazing resource. But it's again, an example of collective action and how that can produce and generate so much. So this idea of like dialogue and engagement. And I think that idea of querying or questioning the archive is something that also I get to do with projects in practice. One of um, the most moving experiences was getting to design a book about the fashion designer, Willie Smith, who was like finding a long lost uncle that I didn't know about. And as much as we love the design and the final products, it was about pouring through submitted um, files from the client. It was um, finding Willie Smith in drag, like seeing him, um, with his friend Dan Friedman, who was one of the few queer graphic designers in my design history class at RISD. Um, he's there in a picture with Willie Smith and Laurie Millet in Paris, like finding different entry points to be like, whoa, this person did so much and was connected to like so much about me that I didn't know. And I had to like find out through a client project. And so part of what I'm finding in my practice is like, on learning and, and relearning and, you know, including references like Dan Friedman or like sort of modernisms that come, but also like um, Virgil Abloh and like, like other contemporary things, how to fuse them and, and like how to also play and experiment how to make things that feel wrong. One of the things in this project we were also thinking about is the type designer kind of like um, what Ramon was saying about the Latinx type designers we wanted to include um, black type designers, um, which we did. But also sometimes product research is this kind of material form, like how do you make a book feel like it's a body or referencing the idea of uh, bogging down the runway, um, even down to the details of the grid or the structure of the publication is very sacred to us. And some of the other things that we we're also thinking about was ideas of cruising and voyeurism and also just trying to explore a range of opulentness and to see like how much is too much, how can you be extra in certain ways. And part of that is also in dialogue when you have a client that's very thoughtful who is unearthing history as we go. So as we were working on the project, we were getting new materials, we were finding new information about Willie and being able to like dig in archives together. Um, and then after hundreds and hundreds of covers, like finally finding a voice to something that felt like it really rang true and had a certain edge. And one of the big things about this project was also thinking about Willie Smith as a ghost. He painted his showrooms in this flat gray material, which was inspired by the Christopher Street Piers and done in collaboration with Psych Architects. And so um, Willie, like um, some of the artists that Ramon was talking about, unfortunately died of HIV and AIDS. In 1987, at the height of his career, he had a, a company that was doing what we now call gender nonconforming or unisex clothing and streetwear um, that was earning $25 million a year. And Willie was known for not only casting 
models, but also club kids and dancers. Like he really was part of this like innovative crew of people. Here are some of the peers um, uh, in showroom drawings. Uh, but he was sort of like uh, brought a lot of energy and experimentation and also very multidisciplinary, very polymodal, it wasn't just an architecture. He um, commissioned artists, he was very generous. And again, one of the things I'm most proud of is being able to write about this and write about why we chose Joshua Darden's typefaces for this halyard, which is designed by a uh, black queer graphic design or a type designer, which um, we need more of those. And then how does that translate into space? And Ramon, you were talking about sort of like um, spaces in terms of kind of educational or uh, ideological spaces, but also physical space. So this exhibition is the was the first and so far only monographic exhibition of a black designer. Um, I guess maybe you can count the WB Du Bois exhibition that was up as the second, uh, which is something we had the good fortune to work on. But literally a queerness battling uh, 18th century architecture. So how do you actually physically take up space, aesthetically take space um, in a way that uh, leaves a queer legacy? And I think one of the things that I'm most proud about the project, speaking of community networks, is that we made this um, online community archive uh, using cargo technology, which then became this really important way to access the show, which literally opened and then closed the same week because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so through the network of the web, there was this way that people could share and like talk and connect about Willie and um, speak to him. And one of the things we always do is we love to throw a playlist in. For us, music is a form of ether that helps connect us to who we work with. And it's a way to kind of knit ourselves together as we're working you know, across coast to coast. So the last thing I wanna show you is this, which was a recent workshop called R, Open Source Underexposed Reading BIPOC Queer Design. So it was basically taking a lot of this research um, and lineage work and going into a, a Zoom space at the Walker Art Center. It's another interesting connection between Ramon and I, where we were asking and um, speaking with uh, a group of folks about sort of this, what are the ethics of queer research when we're investigating the archives? If you're thinking about going into the past, like there are different closet dynamics, different things to think about. It's like, are we outing folks? What terms do we use? Like. Do we add limits to admission? What about allies? And so I'm gonna just quickly breeze through like a couple of case studies because one of the most important queer publications is Fire, which was edited by Elaine Lee Roy Locke, who was gay, but closeted and inspired by uh, a friend of his, you know, race, who's actually a German, white um, or Austrian graphic designer and artist who inspired Aaron Douglas, um, who was also kind of working on various projects. Um, and it's just interesting to see these kind of like allyships and different sexual orientations, you know, part of the new Negro and why Elaine Locke wrote it was Lang Langston Hughes, who was bisexual. So it's sort of kind of this really interesting thing to think about networks of influence or overlap Part of our research, Brian found these, who's indigenous, he's a member of the Monica Nation, found these like posters that Vinod Reese also did um, related to indigenous portrayal. And so obviously there's some cringe factors to some of this, but also wondering like, oh, the importance of visibility and being seen, even if it's sort of a painful thing, how do, how do we kind of reconcile or think about that? This is the cover of Fire that I was talking about. And then these, these networks, you know, Aaron Douglas is not queer, but is black. and He's working with Bruce Nugent and Wallace Sermon who are queer and different levels of openness. Um, and so that just idea of like, what is in the edges or what is included, I think is really interesting. And also just trying to think about a plurality of queerness. So I'm thinking about the activist Ernestine Eccleston um, who was featured in this issue of the, the Ladder in 1966 and then Nat, uh, Piper, a uh, non-binary alphabet artist in 2020, reviving this type. Um, she was one, Ernestine was one of the first, um, one of the only black protesters at a, a queer um, sort of equality 
protest um, in front of the White House, like queerness, but also like civil rights. And part of this kind of work is also just stumbling on things like I know nothing about. Um, right now, you're looking at Men of Color, which is a publication by Vegas Studios, where he was really exploring like early digital typography. This is from 1989, which is like super fascinating, but like I know nothing about him. And I'm like really trying to um, trace and, and, and find out like, what is this about? There's photography and um, when you're talking about spiciness and like intimacy and um, uh, digital drawings and just so, so many interesting layers. And part of the work is to kind of ask and, and collectively reach out and talk to mentors like Alan Bell, who published BLK Magazine, which is an amazing Black queer publication that happened in the 80s, 90s, he's still living. He gave his collection to the One Archives and also the National African American um, History Museum, uh, built, basing his publication on Life Magazine. So kind of showing that Black queerness can, or BIPOC queerness can be every day. What's interesting is that Alan also published and supported Black Lace, which is a less Black lesbian publication um, that was edited by Alice C. J. Jane, who was a grad student at UCLA at the time. And just the visual um, exploration, the support of trans experiences, and just like the boldness is just so inspiring to me. And so the last kind of thing I want to share, Clifford's going to drop a link to this presentation in the chat, but there's a link to um, a Miro, which I think is uh, when I first started my presentation, I was showing this, but um, this is a resource, I'll drop this into the chat too, where um, part of this workshop was sharing what it, uh, I know, but then also learning from other people in the workshop. So um, you can dig into this later after the talk, but there's a lot of archives that you can sort of explore and um, examples of sort of like how to unpack a queer lineage or a, a poetic history lineage. Um, uh, and feel free to add, ask questions. There's comments in here, it's, uh, it's an open file, but I'm very much looking forward to um, chatting with Ramon and answering any questions. And uh, of course, there's also a playlist that I can <laughs> drop into the chat and you can listen to. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Silas, for sharing that. <laughs> I'd be interested to see more of the bad girls uh, pho photography. <laughs> um, totally. Uh, we have about uh, a little bit of time for uh, a Q&A and discussion. Um, if you have anybody in the audience, if you have a question, please feel free to ask in the chat or the Q&A function. And, um, but I, I wanted to start off the talk uh, discussion with a question, perhaps. I, I was noticing, um, just listening to the both of you, you know, what does, what does a chosen family mean to you? Um, I, and I, I have an answer, but I mean, I think it's important to talk about that. Uh, okay, I think, Friends, I was examples of friends, the group of people that perhaps are not necessarily tied to you by family bloodlines, but sometimes take over <laughs> at moments because you can't, there's some stuff you can't talk to families about. And that's where that chosen family, I think comes into play. And I think gay and queer communities have been really, I think this has been one of the ways that they've been able to sustain the communities for so long has been developing these communities and they could be tiny, right? Like it doesn't have to be like a huge community, it could be a tiny. So I think it, that's, to me, that's what it is. And I think at times many of us sort of have partitioned families uh, depending on where we are geographically and or like sort of in all sorts of, of frameworks. That's what it kind of is to me. Yeah, I agree with that. I would add that like the chosen part is not always like me. It's like I get chosen by others. I feel like that's something that I have with Ramon and Brian. There's like kind of a kismet that I think can happen where you need support or you unexpectedly you connect with someone. And like, I remember Ramon, like 
we had met through like an Otis critique and like had all these other encounters. But when we were asked to like work together, we just had this like Zoom call that went until like for four hours. It was like <laughs> meeting someone that like, I was like, oh, how, like how, where have you been? No, I like kind of thing. And I feel like that idea yeah. of, of, of this sort of like reciprocity is a huge part of Chosen Family. Yep. Yeah, I think it's it's important to talk about in the context of um, being queer and being a part of a queer community, you know, because I think a lot of the structures uh, kind of, I'm, I'm rough and I'm thinking back on my own work as, as an artist and photographer of doing the research of uh, families and uh, the structure of families. And I think of Elizabeth Povinelli. Um, I remember, I forget the paper that she wrote, but it was about the genealogical grid and, and, and grids that are intimate, right? That are for the, for people, you know, like what happens to a family tree? Um, if you're, if you're gay, like what about all the people in your life that, that if you're gay or a lesbian or trans, you know, how do those people um fit into that lineage right yeah. um yeah. It, or in that family tree you know so um yeah that's what i was just thinking of and and the other thing i was thinking about too um uh, we, gloria mentioned about decolonization right and mm -hmm. um so i i know both of you had kind of talked about decolonization and, and its importance but what maybe talk about the colonization in terms of like, I guess your own identity, your own sexuality and, and as related to your work and, and design. Yeah, how do you, I, yeah, I think the question too, I was wondering is like, how do you approach, you know, I, I was saying to Clifford, I did a talk for a group of students in Sri Lanka and they were very angry. And I know, by the way, I know Saki too very well. and. Uh, I love him, and he does talk a lot about um, yeah. the struggles that they go through in Africa. But I think one of the questions was the students were angry because they felt they were always they always felt they had to reach a certain Western cultural goal mm -hmm. in their work, and that you can tell that they were angry that they didn't want to continue doing this, and it's something <laughs> where. How do you break through that when they felt that all of that was going to be expected by people who are paying bills, you know, that it was going to be um, only accepted if you accepted a Western ideology? And you're, how do you explain to someone, this is how we do it? Mm, I think that overlapping... especially. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the overlapping question, Clifford, you asked about decolonization and queerness. And then, you know, Gloria, your comment about so the Western pressure. I think for me, the unlocking the decolonization overlapping with queerness is about the power of vulnerability. And mm -hmm. the, the way that I can find freedom is by being soft and like sharing who I am and having the courage to like really uh, reveal my tr true self. Of course, that's kind of layered and complex and navigated in different spaces. But I think that's, that that power of vulnerability is something that I use a lot to deal with power structures. And I feel like that actually mm -hmm. can like, be very disarming and empower collective action, which I think is what's actually needed to change the colonial frameworks that we're operating and working and living in. Yeah, I think for me is, I mean, I think it takes a little bit of time. I, I think part of it is just to, you have to take a step back um, because otherwise it, I think with design is really easy to get all worked up and you want to make the change. And then we're just been ingrained. Colonization has just ingrained so much on us that we don't even realize it's there. And you just go right mm -hmm. automatically into it. And I think you have to take a step back and sort of reflect on what is, dig through the questions that you have about it. And then, then you start to say, oh, this is what I want to do. And I think it takes a little bit of time. I don't think it's an automatic thing. Um, 
I think that gladly, I think the design professions are finally actually paying attention to this. I think we have a lot of work to do outside of schools. I think for those of us that work in academic institutions and are in that environment, we are so far ahead of the conversation. I think the profession, the professions, I should say, are still way behind us. Yeah. Um, because I think we've done some of the, I think we've done some of the the reflect the reflective work at home on our own and collectively as colleagues, departments, um, and I think that that's difficult for students to encounter sometimes because if they don't have a faculty member or a teacher that is engaging with them in that way, they want to do this, um, and I think part of it is also for me is like taking the ownership of making the work that I want to make in this particular way and devising my own processes, just as the myriad of examples that exist in every design and art catalog ad nauseum that exists in the world mm -hmm. that we've all looked mm -hmm. at, a lot of those people in reality, that's what they were doing. The narrative is like, oh, they just geniusly appear to do this. But a lot of them, particularly designers, I think they were just going through a process. And somehow they got lucky enough to write a book, right? Like somebody said, hey, could you write a book? And now we like prop that book up. Like this is the Bible of take your, pick your topic, right? So um, I think it's getting comfortable with that and realizing that I can actually dictate and make decisions as to the perspective that I'm going to enter this. How do I enter it? What's the view? Back to Sister Corita, like you got to see deeper into it. You got to look into it and like sit with it and be like, oh, I don't want to do grids this way. I know we're talking about grids, but I don't want to do grids this way. I don't want to do type that way, right? Like yeah. I jokingly, <laughs> some people on this call might lose it here, but kerning is not going to solve the world's problems, okay? Like I'm just blank. I love typography, but kerning is not it. Like it's not going to solve global warming. <laughs> <laughs> like, let's be real about it. Like, it is fast. Fast. Like, fast. 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 No, fast. 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 not going to solve. Oh. It's not. Global, I mean, it's not climate warming. It's not going right. to solve our. I mean, I think you know, if we turn it correctly, everything will be everything will be perfect. There, there is a question in the a Q and A from Raquel. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Raquel. And she says, I'm new to the formal study of typography. Do either of you have reading recommendations for learning type theory that is not Eurocentric? Um, <laughs> that's- I'll let you guys take the, this. Type is the last frontier in graphic design, I think with this. I mean, I think type, we have a ton of work with type to deal with. I think a lot, one of the really good resources, um, Raquel is, I, there's this book by Scriptural, which you might have seen. Um, it's I find it to be a really good resource for um, students. Did I just put that in the chat? Yeah, I did, right? Yeah, um, yeah it's in there. And one, one of the things that I find really interesting about it, because I thought it was another book full of examples of graphic design done in different languages, which I really don't have time for those books anymore. Like, I don't. Um, I can go to your website and look up the pictures. But what this book did really beautifully is that each section of each language has a contextual essay that speaks to the structure of the language and why mm -hmm. certain decisions are made by designers. And then they show you the examples as to they're looking at the structure of the language itself. And I think that that's really important to look at. Um, mm -hmm. Instead of the thing that has happened, which is let's just plug everybody into a Latin structure, even though your language may not at all work that way. Right. So I think that's a really good resource to do. And I think for students, it's been really helpful to engage with like the section of the like, their language falls into this, you know, kind of language and, and structure and, and just get some context as to this, to how it can work. Yeah, I would that's also great. add through yeah. to, the, to the chat, this um, new collective of type of education called Type Electives. Right. Juan Villanueva mm -hmm. and Lin Yun have mm -hmm. organized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, like there's only a few active classes right now, but there were a lot. They just started their first semester. There's some archives of recordings there. I feel like that is a really amazing place to look. And then also Juan has a, this thing called Tall Faces as Cultural Objects, where he's looking at like typefaces from the Latinx perspective. I would also say that Letter from Archive is really starting, if you look at their lecture series, they are really starting to like bring in wider voices like fr from 
various perspectives around the world. Um, they have like a Vimeo YouTube link where some things are, uh, a lot of their lectures are free and open. You can like watch them. Um, but and don't forget like the HMC membership. too. Yeah. You know, yes, <laughs> yes, you know, totally, totally. You have to remember, yeah. you know, we, you know we've, we've, we've really embraced, we've had, you know, some very interesting exhibitions, Raquel, on um, multi scripts and, you know, really trying to look at, you know, non Latin languages. I think that's super important. And also, we've done, uh, we did a beautiful publication on Mujeres Hispanas y Tapografía on uh, five women, Hispanic women from uh, uh, around the world, Spain, Peru, you know, Mexico, and how they approach whether it's research or language design. Um, so it's, and again, we, we, we wanted to have it strictly done by women too, to add another layer to, right. uh, to the mix of, of uh, developing languages based on, read based upon your culture. And Clifford, I think if anyone's interested, Clifford um, can send it to you. Well, you have to buy it, but we can buy it on our website. Oh yes, let me get and, the, the link for that. Sorry. But I agree with you. I think this is important that you make yep. choices and we're constantly thinking here, how can we be more expansive? You know, and where do you find your resources? So we appreciate from you guys any any resources or any people you want to point us to. We're we'll be glad to, you know, take your suggestions, especially if you find something that's really interesting and bring yeah. it to our attention. Yeah, and I think Laura, something you said earlier when we were chatting before the conversation started. Um Something that I think is super helpful and I still do it too. I mean, Instagram is a really good resource in many ways. I know there's issues, but connecting with designers that you encounter that are actually making work in whatever country you want to work with, I think it's critical because at least for me, what I found is my perspective of my, my idea of design is a very Americanized sort of Western <laughs> European which yeah. may not be the way a designer in X country functions, yeah. right? A historical, like Mexico, I've been to Mexico many times and I just, it's yeah. just like, that's not how design functions. Capital D design yeah. is this thing for selling gas and bad hot dogs, right? Real design right. is something that's been happening for thousands of years in Mexico, right? Like it's, mm -hmm. and I think that starting to investigate that and i think that digging through the lineage living digging through your lineage to see what else inspires you rather than looking at another sort of graphic design or design artifact of history looking at that personal lineage, i think it's part of i think sort of what silas and i have been sort of really digging through whether we're exploring mm -hmm. you know a black culture latinx culture queer culture a hybridity of all because we realized that all these people were actually having dinner together somewhere in new york at some point <laughs> so there's a photo of them all like having dinner and we're like whoa what happened all these people cross paths i think that that's um using that resource i think i'm sending those messages saying hey i'm a student or hey i'm a designer and i want to chat with you about this yeah. i think that that's really mm -hmm. incredible a, a really powerful tool that sometimes we don't we underestimate yeah. Yeah, we cross cultural estimate. exchange. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, and, and before we end, we, we also underestimate how receptive most people are. You know, right. I mean, especially if you're young or a student, you know, you say, Oh, I can't possibly contact Silas or I can't possibly contact Ramon. There's a certain amount of intimidation. But I'm right. saying, no, you should never be intimidated. It's everyone's basically we're human guys <laughs> you know, we're all we all might have different clothing on us and different skins but underneath we're basically skeleton you know <laughs> we walk the planet you know differently so don't be afraid to contact people right. you know to mm -hmm. have to start a dialogue with them especially it's much easier today too you know through social media you know in a, in a respectful right. way <laughs> yeah. exactly but clifford are we finished I think yeah, we're definitely done. Yeah, but I wish we could. Done. I wish we could keep on talking because both of you are so uh, yes. talented yes. and and great. It's finally great to have both of you um, to host you right. uh, at the HMCT virtually. Virtual. <laughs> yes. Thank, thank you. Please, thank you. Thank you. Please thank stop you. by. Stop by. We hope, stop by. We hope to see you. Come 
play with the letterpress. Yes. Press. Yeah. Thank you again. Totally. Thank you, Clifford. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.